PowerPoint presentation, which is a sort of a once around the block uh, for the uh, archives uh, reference tool for the history of culture. We're going to do it in uh, a structure that, that we've used before, uh, using these questions uh, as uh, our, our points of reference. First of all, we're going to look at what archives is and then continue with um, having a look at what is in it. Um, as we've said before, and as you can see on the uh, home page, which is shown here, uh, we've called it a reference tool for the history of culture. Of course, that's quite a, an abstract uh, concept, so what exactly do we mean by that? Um, this first screen shows uh, that it is a reference tool, as we uh, understand it, that, for instance, informs social historians and anyone who is interested in the iconography of alcohol abuse. On the right you can see uh, a thumbnail, the start of a thumbnail gallery that at this point in time uh, contains about 650 images that have to do with the concept alcohol abuse. And on the left you can see, um, which is a box that is ticked next to drunkenness, which is over here. So that's the concept, the icon class concept. A uh, group of people that might be interested in a very different group of images from the database might be ornithologists, for instance, interested in all kinds of images uh, with parrots. And parrots might be from uh, still lives, but they may also be from emblem books or quite a different uh, type of material, which we can see later on. Archives can be uh, so broad ranging from parrots to uh, alcohol abuse because it brings together content from quite a hybrid variety, wide variety of both visual and textual sources of which you can see here some uh, iconic images from photographs to um, early modern emblem books. In, a, in essence it's a collection of collections from different types of institutions. We have uh, material from museums, from libraries, from research institutes, from archives. And you can see here a number of um, collections. In all we have about 15 uh, institutions from which we at present have material. What they all share is that they use a standard classification uh, for cultural content, icon class, which we sell, see quite a lot more, which is a, a an open uh, data tool it's linked open data and everyone can, can use it and it's used in several hundreds institutions across the world. Who is it aiming at uh, archives? Who is it for? Well, it's quite a long and uh, growing list of, of people of which you can see here quite a, a random selection. Of course, art historians, uh, uh, historians of religion, mythology, but also quite a number of um, groups of scholars you might not immediately associate with the study of imagery, uh, like those uh, interested in medicine, history of medicine and health. Um, this, there's quite an, a, a lot of uh, useful information for them as well. To the theme of for who is it for, you can see, for instance, again, uh, musicologists will also find quite a, a bit of visual material of instruments, musical instruments being played in all kinds of settings, as you can see with this small sample here. They're from various uh, ages, uh, with quite an extensive, some 10 or 12,000 images from medieval manuscripts, from the Royal Library in The Hague, Museum Mimano, and that's a growing collection as well. Um, so this is a, a small chamber orchestra in a biblical setting, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, and the uh, young men in the fiery oven in the background. A famous young stain painting with uh, musical instruments being used and uh, songs being sung in the 17th century. And here we have from a very different uh, setting and a different, very different Italian collection, one of our partner collections a 19th century uh, um, orchestra playing, a band playing, and it's an illustration from Le Rire, which is a French satirical journal from the late 19th century. 
Um, one of the major collections in archives, a very important collection, uh, is the collection of emblems. We have at the moment uh, over 25,000 uh, emblems that are catalogued and described very often in quite detailed uh, list of icon class um, concepts and also in uh, captions in English. Of course, emblems are more or less hidden in books, so to browse through a whole book is also a feature that is very useful. Um, we have, I think at the moment, something like 200 complete books in archives, quite a bit of whom are indexed and uh, also transcribed in detail. The text is transcribed, for instance, of this book. Uh, again, returning to social and economic historians, uh, you can find images related to um, the imposition of taxes, for instance. You have fiscus, where you can see a king um, with a sponge from which he is able to squeeze uh, probably the blood of his, uh, of his people. That's the image. And one of the people who was one of the, the persons who was not able to pay obviously is led away on the left, probably to prison. Another image of tax collectors with a parrot in the left corner, so sometimes uh, things um, come together. Some more technical information on how to use archives, how does it function. Um, very basic it starts with, if you want to, you can start with a word search through the full text index. Um, suggestions are made on the basis of what you type. Um, it's an autocomplete feature, which is a very common thing. And it's, a, it's a full text index, which means that you're actually looking for words, of course, not concepts. And words may be uh, occurring in, in various places in a metadata record. They may be from the iconographic description, but they may also be uh, from provenance information, from titles, etc. So sometimes um, you can use a word and then get very surprising results, uh, which is always the case with word searches. To increase uh, precision, you can make use of the icon class concepts going back one screen. Uh, as you can see, I was starting to type beggar up here, and then I found beggar, and then I moved to uh, one of the uh, images, a random one, and then I picked from that, from that description, I picked the icon class concept for beggar, which is much more precise, of course, than the word itself. Also interesting is that beggar in icon class has a number of cross-references to beggant uh, um, orders, monastic orders like Augustinians and Franciscans. And it also has um, a cross-reference to a quite different iconographic theme, the blind leading the blind. And it also shows uh, two more precise uh, terms, narrower terms, from beggar to begging bowl or beggar's procession. So that's one of the benefits of icon class to which we would, will return. Um, did, going the other way, you can go from beggar up here. You can go up in the hierarchy and extend uh, your selection, cast the net wider. So you go from beggar to the poor, and we could do, uh, we could do that with more uh, results, of course, because the, when you cast the net wider, you get more images. But basically, as you, you will agree, that this is a, an English system here on the left. Um, but because Icon Glass as a whole is multilingual, with one click, you can switch to what now is um, Icon Glass in French, which means that although the people cataloging a certain collection may be using English primarily, uh, because of the, the use of icon class, you can allow people to search in French or Italian or German, and basically also in Finnish, and uh, we hope shortly to be able to offer it also in Portuguese. In archives, you can enrich existing information that's produced by catalogers at a specific institution as a researcher 
uh, you, can, you can enrich the information yourself. Um, on the left you can see at the top that this is an image, a Dürer print, indexed and described at the Rijksmuseum. Um, you can also see that one single concept was uh, used as a tag for this, uh, for this print, this engraving, and it's uh, a woodcut of course. Uh, melancholic temperament was used, and then um, I added as a sample user, I took on a different role, and as a sample user I added a number of um, additional concepts, so other polyhedron, which describes this one, and there's a key somewhere down here. Uh, of course, many more could have been uh, added, depending on, on your research interest. Another feature is you can create your own uh, data set and you can share the data set you've, you've selected or you can uh, keep it for yourself. The data set shown here is on the theme of friendship which I created some time ago and we we'll, might have occasion later to, to have a look at it. But you can see that it, it cuts through uh, Eichenglass concepts um, so you can select your own label you can create a little bit of text describing the purpose of the selection and then you can select um, whatever image or uh, piece of text like this proverb you think is relevant for this selection of friend on friendship. Another feature um, is that you can create links between documents that are in archives already and also between uh, archives content and external um, web pages. But first we're going to show you how you can create a link between two documents. In this case, um, the two prints and both have um, a, a female uh, personification. One is of melancholia and the other is of arithmetics, arimetria. And both also have a, a cupid or at least a winged boy taking notes or writing something. So there's sort of a visual echo between the two, which for me in this case was reason enough to wanting to want to create a link between the two. So how you do that? There's a, a button um, which you can see, which is called clipboard, which means that if you click on that, you will put the um, the image that you're actually looking at at a certain point on the clipboard for later uh, inclusion in other um, other records. So put this one on the clipboard and then go to the other one where you want to create a link to and then it's simply clicking on this one, link this object and your clipboard. So it's just two clicks to create a link between two objects and then share the fact that you've linked it and add a little piece of text to explain the reason for the link. And any, anyone or other uh, users of archives can see uh, your observation, your link. So it's also a tip for others. There are some additional services. One of them and one of the most essential ones because it allows us to uh, smoothly co collaborate with institutions, with partner institutions, that we create dedicated Eichenglass retrieval browsers for partners. And partners in this case merely have to have Eichenglass information in their database. And with a very basic operation we can create a, a separate dedicated Eichenglass browser for them which they can very easily and without almost without any programming, which is very important because that's very expensive usually, can include in their own uh, website. So if you look carefully at the selection of images here, and I'll click to this one, <coughs> sorry, it's basically the same selection, it's uh, almost 40,000 prints in the so-called Virtuelles Kupferstich Cabinet, the Virtual Print Cabinet, and everything which, which is inside this grey line is kept on archive servers but it's offered as a plugin uh, to 
um, the Herzog August Bibliothek, the Herzog August Library, and the Anton Ulrich Museum in Braunschweig, both German institutes collaborating on this virtual print cabinet. So they don't have to do any programming and still have the um, all kinds of additional facilities to offer to their end users, which is a nice way to collaborate. In return, we get their permission to use the images and basic metadata in archives. We would like to include more collections or create links to more collections and these collections may come from institutions that are already using IconClass and now finally want to offer their end users an easy way of making the most of the IconClass encoding that they have done. Uh, sometimes institutions that still want to add IconClass to their search options, uh, we can help them do that, especially if they have already used controlled vocabularies. And then one of the techniques we use is to create a concordance between their vocabularies and an IconClass um, uh, encoding. And finally, in this case, the, the people we are also thinking of are individual researchers, of which we already have some samples, who would like to integrate their own research data sets, which are often very, very interesting um, and, and very specific, containing very specific information, to integrate them with the uh, whole of archives, which often uh, contains some supplementary information already. One other thing is that there's going to be more software development. Um, I'm, going, I'm showing you now uh, a map uh, from Google, uh, um, a piece from Google Maps with an overlay from a 17th century map of the city of Amsterdam. In the middle you can see the little flags here all represent a publisher or a, uh, a printer, and in this case it's Martin Jansson Brandt from the early 17th century working in Amsterdam. And clicking on one of those um, organizes a, a pop-up from the archives database of, in this case, the printer devices of Martin Jansson and Brandt, who are also clickable from this screen. So this is what we call, uh, for the moment now, geocontexting. And it's our aim to uh, extend that for more cities, uh, depend, dependent on the information we, we can gather. Um, one other thing it's, it's mentioned here is image recognition software, which is also in the works, but in a very early stage, so that we hopefully we're going to be able to show more of that in maybe six months or a year. Well, that's one of the things we all need, more collaboration, and hopefully not just like the whole leading the blind, um, but everything, all, all bits of, inf of collaboration, of course, will help us. This is additional information which you can easily find also on the Brill uh, website uh, if you're interested in sales. You can find it there.